All right, it's 7.01. I've given grace period, a one minute grace period for many who may be still wanting to join us. Uh, my name is Mike Wilbanks. I'm one of the pastors at Santa Barbara Community Church. And I just wanted to um, welcome you, say thanks and explain in just a few seconds what you're gonna see. Um, this idea came from some members of the church family and I was continuing to be asked some questions about what's going on with the COVID vaccine. I am not a scientist or a health professional, so I can't answer any of those questions. Um, but we have people in our church family who are scientists and health profession professionals. None of these people asked to do this. <laughs> um, we asked all of them if they'd be willing to share some of their knowledge and uh, experience here. And I want to let you know at the beginning, what our hope is in this is not to uh, push a certain agenda that is our church position on the COVID vaccine, but rather to allow you a space to hear from some people that we know and love in our church family. And so let me introduce them to you real quickly. Uh, Carolyn Murphy is a physician and uh, yeah, she's been a part of community church for quite a while now. Heather Crawshaw is an emergency room nurse at Cottage. And Steve Julio is a PhD in biology and has a emphasis in or focus in infectious diseases. And uh, finally, Todd Fear is also a, a physician in our church that uh, has served in many different capacities. So I'm just gonna turn it over right away and allow them to address you. Thanks again for joining us. So I'm going to start and I'm gonna read my remarks in the interest of time so that I'm not editorializing or wandering down different paths. So. I want to open by thanking you for tuning in. While the vaccine may be a marvel of science, the decision whether to receive the vaccine may feel very personal or frightening or political or anxiety inducing. Mike certainly did not ask us to establish the church's stance on COVID vaccination. Rather, he asked us to share our knowledge as the staff at the church have been flooded with concerned members seeking information from trusted faith-based sources. Personally, I reluctantly, and yes, I say reluctantly, signed a consent and rolled up my sleeve for the Pfizer injection on Christmas Eve. And I was literally praying as I received it, both prayers of thanksgiving that I should be given early access to the protection that I would receive, but also prayers for protection from the vaccine. I asked the Lord to protect myself and others in the queue from long-term results, from side effects, from acute reactions, from the unknowns. But let me share my reluctance. Several years ago, hundreds of you in the church prayed for me as I lay in the ICU at Cottage with a life-threatening illness that was likely triggered by a five-week-long course of antibiotics that I was on for a rose thorn that had injected a tendon in my hand with a bacterial infection. I had to be on the antibiotics or I would have likely lost my finger, but that five week course of antibiotics eventually led to five months of chemotherapy, blood transfusions, admissions to the hospital, mass doses of steroids, 25 pounds I gained from the steroids and two years of oral immunosuppressants. So even though I am an ER nurse who administers medications in life-saving capacity all the time, I am personally very skittish about taking anything I figure my liver and kidneys and other organs have taken enough insult from the chemo to last a lifetime and I try not to add anything else. I decided to get the vaccine, but it wasn't simple. It wasn't black and white. I signed up several weeks after the rest of the ED, the emergency room had already had their second dose. Frankly, I was scared, but I had worked for months in the ER COVID pods. I'd seen this virus's drastic difference from the 18 flu seasons that I had previously worked. Frankly, I had never seen anything like this virus. If there's time later, I can tell you more about what it's been like in the ER. In a word, I will leave it at exhausting or painful. We make better decisions when we have solid information. So our goal tonight is to weed through the information overload and as Jesus loving professionals, whittle it down to usable portions so that you can make your own choice. As a culture, we are, I believe, entering an era of science worship similar to the enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries. That period gave us Newton, Locke, constitutional government, the scientific method, but despite the tremendous contribution of science to humankind, it did not solve the condition of the human heart. 
We as believers know that our salvation is not through science or knowledge or politics or leadership. We instead rest assured that we can have relationship with our creator through Jesus, the creator who created mRNA, who created musicians and artists and poets and infectious disease doctors and ER nurses. Tonight, we seek only to explain the science, not hold it on an altar. At the end of the day, I personally decided to get the vaccination because I see it as a way to love my neighbor. If I am less able to pass the virus on to a vulnerable person, I feel I am holding their life as sacred. You may have concerns after this evening. Please feel free to reach out to me later. I am happy to listen. I have compassion on your fears. I respect your differing position. But ultimately, I love you as my brother and sister in Christ far more than I care about my far more than I care about my stance. I do believe this vaccine is a good idea for most people, but I'm a good listener and I would love to hear more from you. Mike has my contact info. So I'll ha hand it off to uh, Professor Julia. All right. Uh, Heather, thanks for that perspective. That's actually uh, really comforting and encouraging as we uh, launch into what I hope is useful information um, about the virus and the vaccine. So what I'm gonna do is, my role is to give you a bit of foundational biology, a quick biology lesson here. Uh, so just let me take three or four minutes and tell you what is a virus, what's coronavirus, and how does the vaccine play into that? Okay, so if you think of what a virus is, it's actually quite simple. Up here on the upper left, is the coronavirus, the virus that causes COVID, but it is like any typical virus. And what you see here is you see a particle that has these proteins on the surface and has some nucleic acid or genetic material inside. <laughs> That's basically what a virus is. And what that particle does is, if you look down here, this is, for instance, one of your cells in your nasal cavity or lungs, what the virus does, it binds to a receptor. In the case of coronavirus, you might have heard of the ACE2 receptor. That's the specific thing on the surface of your cells the virus recognizes. It gets inside of the cell. Once it does, I'm gonna skip a whole lot of biology here. It makes more of itself, rather complicated process. And then it just leaves the cell. In the case of coronavirus, one entry can make about a thousand new virus particles. They leave the cell and they go and infect other cells. And of course, they're also gonna activate the immune system that tries to combat that infection. For instance, you've probably heard of antibodies, which is what one of the things that the immune system does to try to combat the virus. So, so that's the virus life cycle in a nutshell. It's again, more biologically complicated than that, but this is what coronavirus does. So how does the vaccine play into that? So what vaccines do essentially is they are either a weakened, killed, or a component of a virus or a bacteria that typically gets injected intramuscularly. And what that does is it simply primes the immune system as though the immune system is actually seeing the infection itself. It's not, it's seeing a vastly watered down version of the infection so you don't get sick from the actual vaccination. However, you prime the immune system more or less as you would if you saw the actual live pathogen. So in this slide right here, this is showing one thing that the immune system does. The immune system makes antibodies. You've heard that word being thrown around quite a bit. That's one of the ways the immune system can specifically attack whatever pathogen, virus, bacteria it's recognizing. And the idea with vaccination is quite simple. If you get vaccinated, that vaccination can last sometimes for months, sometimes years, sometimes decades. It depends on the vaccination. So that if you are ever to see the actual live version of the virus or bacteria, your immune system immediately launches into action, takes those antibodies and sequesters or subdues the infection before you ever get symptomatic. That's the basic idea. So if we go back to this idea of coronavirus and COVID, Here's the way this works. So if you look at the virus, and this is another rendition of the virus, computer animated, inside that virus that has these proteins kind of studded on the surface is its nucleic acid. And this is called RNA. You've heard of DNA, which is in all of our cells, coronavirus that causes COVID, 
uses RNA, which is quite similar to DNA. That RNA is about 30,000 units called nucleotides long. There's lots going on on that really long piece of RNA that's inside the virus, but a particular concern, at least for vaccination purposes, is this one piece of the RNA right here called S, because on that piece of the RNA, that's what actually is the instructions to make the protein called spike, and you've heard of spike, it's the one that sits on on your host cell. Folks who design and implement vaccines are realizing that that could be used to actually make a number of different types of vaccines. I'm going to focus on the Moderna and Pfizer because those are the ones that are currently available for individuals. Okay, so here is what Pfizer and Moderna did. They took this one particular segment of the RNA of the virus, just this portion, so not the entire viral nucleic acid, just this one segment, and they packaged it up into what are called lipid nanoparticles, which looks really complicated, but really it's just mimicking what the structure of one of your own cells more or less looks like. So that is the actual vaccine. It's a part of the virus RNA, mRNA, packaged into this particle that kind of looks like the outer part of a cell. That gets injected. Immune cells take up this vaccine because you have the instructions for the spike protein, RNA. Those immune cells that took up the vaccine make the spike protein. They make those antibodies specifically to the spike protein. And once that happens, those antibodies, what they do, at least with regard to the spike protein, is they prevent the virus from being able to recognize the entryway into cells. And in doing that, you can block the infection from coronavirus getting into host cells and protect the individual from getting symptomatic disease. And that's basically how the vaccine works. So quick biology lesson, but from remarkably from infections first being recognized at the end of 2019 to just about one year later, this really is quite a scientific and medical marvel. We went from an unknown pathogen to sequencing all 30,000 units of this RNA to using that information to design vaccines, to developing these vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna being a couple of examples, to doing what are called clinical trials to show it that they're safe and effective, and then currently mass producing and distributing these vaccines to be able to effectively end the pandemic, hopefully in a few months time. Okay, end of biology lesson. I will turn it over to Carolyn. Unmuting here, hi, thanks Steve. Um, I'm gonna be reading my portion. I have a lot of information I want to cover, and I'm hoping it's clear, but I'm just sticking to my notes. Um, I wanted to share up front a great description I have heard regarding the way mRNA vaccines work. So as we know, the vaccine doesn't actually contain the virus itself. This vaccine is instead a message sent to your immune system that shows it what the virus looks like, gives instructions to kill it, and then like a Snapchat message, it disappears. Remember, it does not enter the nucleus of the cell, so it doesn't affect your DNA and therefore has no lasting impact on your cell. The RNA molecules are highly unstable on their own and our blood contains enzymes that rapidly degrade floating RNA in minutes. They disappear like a Snapchat, so just remember that. Um, tonight we're focusing on the mRNA vaccines since these are the ones that are FDA approved. Between both Pfizer and Moderna trials, 37,000 people were tested in phase three of the trials along with an additional 37,000 people that got placebo. They were randomized controlled trials, which, which are the gold standard for effective research. People were assigned randomly to the vaccine or placebo group, and researchers were blinded to which groups um, subjects were in. Moderna was found to be 94% effective in preventing COVID and 100% effective in preventing severe COVID. Pfizer was 95% effective in preventing COVID. These percentages show higher efficacy than most other vaccines we know. 
I just want to show, a, I'm going to share my screen here and show it. This is just of the Moderna trial. Just a moment here. So you can see with Moderna phase three trial, there were 30,000 volunteers. Um, this is leaving out the Pfizer trial. They were very similar though. 15,000 people got the vaccine. Um, 15,000 people got a placebo. This is random. It, it reduces bias when it's random. Um, it was blinded. So researchers don't know which group the subjects are in. Um, it ended when there were 196 cases of COVID and 30, 30 severe cases. And I don't know if we can see this. I'll move it aside here. My box is moving us. Um, basically, uh, let me just pull this out here. How do I? I'm not good at this. Um, I'll make this a little smaller, maybe. There we go. Here. Um, when it was unblinded, there were 185 cases in the placebo group versus 11 cases in the vaccine group. 94.3% effective, and all 30 cases were in the placebo group. That's all the only um, slide I'm going to show there. But what about safety and reaction to the vaccine? You've probably heard about some people getting fevers and other reactions after receiving it. The mRNA itself is not causing the fever reactions, but rather it's the lipid nanoparticle coating that Steve told us about. Um, this coating helps it cross your cell membrane and relay the message. Um, the fevers reported by participants in the trial were short term, less than 12 hours. Um, most common side effects are minor, mild injection site reactions, headache, fatigue, joint pain, muscle aches, and fever, like I said. These are self-limited. Side effects are more frequent and after the second dose. Some severe reactions have, in, have been listed as Bell's palsy, which is a temporary one-sided facial paralysis. Uh, I guess four out of the 21,000 in the Pfizer arm um, got Bell's palsy. But then when it's looked at further, uh, the, the incidence in the general population is actually similar. So it's hard to say necessarily that there's a causality. Uh, a CDC review of the safety data to date have found very recently that Bell's palsy is no more common in COVID vaccinated patients than unvaccinated. Nor is, the rate, nor is the rate of death or other severe health complications, just looking at general incidence of death or other complications. Um, allergic reactions have occurred as well, but anaphylaxis to vaccines is extremely rare. So far it's occurred in 0.00055% of those vaccinated. The component polyethylene glycol is suspect, suspected to be the cause. These reactions are extremely rare, as I said, and if they do occur, they occur quickly and we can treat them. This is why we monitor people for 15 minutes after receiving the vaccine and up to 30 minutes in those who have a history of allergic reactions. Meanwhile, more than one in a thousand people have died in this country due to COVID. That's crunching the number of COVID deaths uh, against our population. So it's important to weigh the risks. Uh, you have, you risk, your risk of serious side effects from the vaccine are far lower than your risk of serious side effects from the virus. Even in a young, healthy person, the risk of dying from COVID isn't zero. Even if you don't die from it, you could have long-term damage to your organs, including the lungs, heart, kidneys, and brain. What about long-term data? Obviously, we have a, lot, a lack of long-term safety data right now, but mRNA vaccine trials from 2013 with MERS, 1,280 trial participants and no long-term severe adverse events were reported. That's eight years ago. The participants in these Pfizer and Moderna vaccine trials are continued, continuing to be monitored for, for safety and will be followed for a minimum of two years. So we're still collecting data. We're not done. For example, um, sorry, I was gonna, excuse me there just a minute. Um, adverse reactions from vaccines in general often occur within the first two months of vaccination, um, just in all vaccines. For example, you can develop thrombocytopenia, a decrease in platelets, um, platelets help to clot our blood. That can happen from the MMR vaccine. Um, and you can get Guillain-Barre syndrome from the flu vaccine. Those are kind of more immediate reactions. They don't happen within 15 minutes, but they can happen in a few months right after. What do we know about length of immunity? Not a lot, but there's been speculation that immunity will last about a year. Those vaccinated last May still have a good immune response. Further time will tell, but likely will need yearly boosters. What about pregnant mothers? The CDC, FDA, a which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and ABM, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, all recommend vaccinating pregnant and breastfeeding women. 
Pregnant women were not included in the initial trials, but of note, individuals who got pregnant during vaccine trials have had no complications from the vaccine. There have been DART studies, which are, stands for Developmental and Reproductive Toxicology Studies, where rats were given the vaccine dose prior to mating and also during gestation to look for abnormalities. There were no adverse effects on female reproduction, fetal development, or postnatal development. Remember that mRNA degrades too quickly to actually even reach the growing baby. However, we do know that pregnant individuals are at higher risk for COVID-19 complications. You're in a higher risk category if you are pregnant. We don't yet have specific data regarding maternal vaccination and breastfeeding, but antibody protection is one of the best, best benefits of breastfeeding. And likely there would be some immunity transmitted from mother to baby. Um, and I can share this uh, or in an email later, but there are two good Instagram accounts to follow if, if you're interested in resources on COVID and pregnancy. One was at Mama Dr. Jones, another was Dr. Marta Perez. I could share that later. Unfortunately, there's been some misinformation that the vaccine will cause infertility. The myth is that the same proteins for the virus are the same proteins in the placenta and that your body will be confused and attack the placenta if you get the vaccine. Our bodies are smarter than that. God's actually smarter than that. <laughs> While their amino acid sequences have some similarities, they are not the same. And those that are, um, and those that are naturally infected with COVID-19 also have, an have antibodies. So if this were true, we'd see a higher level of pregnancy loss in the community overall, which we are not. Anecdotally, there were dozens of vaccine trial participants who got pregnant after receiving the vaccine. What about kids? As you know, kids can get infected with COVID too, but they have milder cases in general. Most often we've seen that they're getting it from the adults in their lives. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence for big spread between children. Children can still suffer though and be hospitalized from this virus, although less frequently than adults. Uh, they can asymptomatically or symptomatically transmit this virus to people. So there should be a vaccine for them as well. Vaccine studies are happening. The Pfizer vaccine is currently approved for those 16 and over, but there's a trial underway for those 12 to 15 years old, uh, which started in October. Moderna is still enrolling for their trial for those 12 to 17 years old, which started in December. Hopefully we'll have some good data and be able to vaccinate children by the end of this year. Certainly it will be best to get everyone vaccinated who's able and willing. I believe that if we can increase vaccination among adults and decrease transmission overall, we will get closer to reaching herd immunity and it will be a much safer place for the whole community. I'm muted. Now I'm back. So uh, I guess I'm the caboose on this train. And uh, as is the case, you know, I, I think that in a lot of medical lectures, there's a certain amount of repeti repetition. You're about to hear some of it probably, but I just want to lead off saying uh, a lot of very bright people, friends of mine who are smart in other disciplines have asked me questions about vaccine safety. So I, I, it's a general community concern. And I'm glad that those of you listening have tuned in to try and settle the issue in your own mind. We all have to make our own decision on this. Some people have raised concerns about safety. Others feel like they're kind of bulletproof because maybe they're young and they just feel like the consequences are minimal if they catch the virus. Uh, but I'll say that even among healthcare workers who have access to the vaccine or have had access, there's not been 100% adoption. There are uh, plenty of hospital workers or healthcare workers who just opted out. And um, so uh, <clears throat> I'm not here to sell, but I, I'm here to try and draw out some parallels and facts that may help you make a decision for yourself. You, many of you have experience having received vaccines of one type or another, one uh, being tetanus boosters, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, Maybe the chickenpox vaccine, if you're young and didn't have chickenpox, if you were born after 1957 or so, uh, all of these do the same kind of thing. They, they cause our bodies to uh, induce either cellular or antibody response against foreign proteins uh, so that we can recognize and either block them or uh, label them for removal or destroy them directly. Um, that's what our immune systems are good at doing. Uh, and so the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are now available, as been said, 
uh, simply employ our own cells to uh, equip them to single out a critical protein from the surface of the virus that we can recognize and say, this is foreign, this is not of us, and therefore it doesn't belong here, it needs to go. Um, this isn't our first run with coronaviruses. I know Heather probably knows, and uh, I see there are probably a handful of uh, coronaviruses on our respiratory panel. We can do a quick respiratory panel with um, DNA amplification uh, that brings up a lot that are behind uh, bronchitis or common cold type of syndrome. Uh, and those we don't worry about, we just know if they're there. But also going back to 2002, 2003, there was uh, SARS-CoV-1, the uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by coronavirus, first edition, if you will. Uh, that uh, arose in Guangdong province in China and had a really profound uh, case fatality rate of about 9.6% versus like the 2.3% we have with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, it disproportionately affected the elderly and thankfully it largely uh, died out by around 2004, except in some laboratory outbreaks subsequently. And then in 2012, um, Carolyn alluded to the MERS-CoV, which was the uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, largely in Saudi Arabia. It was caused by a novel coronavirus. Uh, interestingly, in that outbreak, uh, they began to do work with vaccination of camels, which were a reservoir, and they were able to cut down viral. That was part of how it kind of quiet down. And it's not really a factor these days. Um, turning though to the issue, and I would just ask you to think about and to compare and contrast what happens when you're vaccinated versus what happens when you're exposed to a virus. So in vaccination, a nurse or a doctor will inject a foreign protein in your arm. And in the case of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, uh, this genetic material enters our cells, causing it to produce a foreign protein, which we in turn recognize and react against. Now in a viral uh, infection, a wild strain introduces itself into our cells. It ejects its genetic material, causing our own cells to produce a foreign protein. However, these proteins assemble into a virus. And as Steve has told us, uh, there's exponential expansion of that virus and it causes infection uh, as it runs rampant in our bodies until it's curtailed one way or another. Uh, so either way, I mean, the vaccine turns our cells into little factories to make foreign proteins. Uh, the virus itself turns our cells into little factories to make foreign proteins. Uh, but turning to what an actual infection looked like, what does COVID do to people? Well, first of all, the point of entry, as Steve mentioned, through these uh, specific receptors on cell surfaces, uh, largely centered in the respiratory tract, uh, make entry. And they uh, might cause us to cough, might cause fever, might cause shortness of breath. But because these receptors are distributed more broadly on other uh, cells in other parts of our body, uh, they can gain entry to our gastrointestinal tract. So we may manifest diarrhea or vomiting. Um, this virus has affinity for cells in our urogenital system so that uh, it can, they can affect our kidneys. And for men, they can affect the testes. Uh, they have the capacity, this, these viruses have the uh, capacity to enter our central nervous system especially through the olfactory area that is responsible for our smell in the nose. And probably that has something to do with the fact that there's loss in many patients of sense of smell and taste. Um, this virus has the capacity to enter our hearts and actually cause crippling heart muscle damage. Um, it has the capacity to form, to induce uh, production of blood clots so that uh, people can have blood clots in their legs, in their lungs. Some, uh, even under the age of 50, have had without other risk factors. 
And probably more fortunately, the virus has the capacity to light up our immune response and cause this thing uh, called cytokine storm, which is what comes to land people largely in the intensive care unit with acute respiratory distress and uh, with multi-organ system failure. Uh, but finally, uh, there is this notion of, of long COVID or chronic COVID and a substantial subset of people who have been infected with the virus have lingering effects, whether they're uh, neurological or psychiatric or just general systemic uh, symptoms of malaise, fatigue, shortness of breath, persistent cough, some. Um, so it's by no means a, a benign thing to have a COVID infection. Um, one month out from the Moderna vaccine, as uh, Carolyn, I think, pointed out, data indicate that 80 to, there's 80 to 90 percent protection even after the first shot. One month out from the Pfizer vaccine, vaccine first injection, uh, data indicate 91 percent infection against the virus. And uh, just be, this hasn't been touched on, but it'll be a relevant topic uh, as we go forward because J&J &J will be soon to have, I think, emergency use authorization for their vaccine. Uh, Johnson & Johnson has a slightly different one-shot vaccine, um, which data indicate protects uh, against a, a, a range of uh, percentages, I should say. 85% in the United States, 57% in South Africa with overall efficacy of 66% um, against moderate to severe disease uh, internationally. But it's noteworthy to point out that of the nearly 44,000 people tested, not one person died of COVID. Not one person had severe enough disease to wind up uh, in the intensive care unit, on a ventilator, um, and so even with this 66% efficacy, it was substantially protective against the things we care about. Um, and I think I'll close off there and just make space for question and answer. Should we do that, Mike? Let's do it. Thank you all. I appreciate you all um, weighing in and I'm even more amazed that uh, our participation didn't drop off rapidly when uh, Steve was sharing his biological information. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, hey, yeah, let's get to some Q&A. And there were some very um, kind of nitty gritty practical questions about some of the vaccines I wanted to get to first. Um, Julie shared, uh, I've heard two of you refer to the need to get the vaccine to prevent spread to others. However, I've read that this vaccine is not necessarily preventing spread to others, but more to prevent the serious adverse effects of this virus. Uh, can someone please address this issue? Does it reduce transmission to others or not? It's not absolutely known. The odds are uh, that substantially it does decrease uh, spread to others. There are several vaccines uh, I can't think of all of them. Diphtheria is one that can allow infection and, and spread, but protects the individual who's been vaccinated. Um, just by tamping down community prevalence, however, the likelihood of someone acquiring a high risk individual in, in particular of acquiring uh, an infection uh, is, it makes a big difference there, so. Mm -hmm. Great. How about um, add to so that? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say so, yeah, the, the endpoints of the studies were not looking for whether people had asymptomatic infection. We didn't test for that in the studies. We're going to learn a lot going forward. I mean, just think about the Super Bowl yesterday. Uh, there are 7,000 healthcare workers in the stands and they were all vaccinated. I mean, there were, uh, you know, 18,000 other people there spread out, but you know, it'll be interesting to see, is there gonna be any spread from these vaccinated um, healthcare workers in this big event? I mean, I don't know if anyone's studying that, but in general, we're gonna be learning a lot going forward. And uh, the issue is, is that there may be, there may be symptomatic or asymptomatic infection that's mild. Um, it may, um, asymptomatic infection, is it spreadable? Is it not? We will learn more about that, but 
we do know that in general, asymptomatic infections don't spread as much as symptomatic. So if we're just reducing people to asymptomatic infections, that is a world of good. That's a dead end. So I just wanted to put that in. Yeah. There, there's a few questions that I've seen about, um, we're hearing about new variants coming out to, to COVID. And how, does, how do the vaccines that are gonna be available um, relate to these new variants that we're seeing? Anybody wanna address that? Well, again, looking at the uh, Johnson & Johnson data and the fact they came up with 66% efficacy versus like 96% efficacy may have to do with the fact that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were tested at a time that these new variants had not yet arisen. Uh, so, but again, you ha have to remember that the seasonal influenza vaccine, which is considered to be worthwhile and effective, may only have 50% efficacy. Um, and as I pointed out, looking at the J&J &J data, you know, in terms of protection against hospitalization and death, I mean, those are the, you wanna stay out of the hospital, you wanna stay out of the morgue as much as any other thing. And, and they seem to make that difference. Uh, furthermore, the technology that's allowed for the rapid uh, creation of the mRNA vaccines uh, allegedly can be modified within a six week period to um, compensate for antigenic variations of the spike protein and uh, uh, make for new vaccine production, notwithstanding additional months that the FDA may want to, to put the modified vaccine through testing. But uh, we're, we're off to a, a good start and we can, we can compensate with things as, for things as they come, I think from this point forward. Yeah, I'll add to that as well. Um, so the at least two, if not three of the vaccines have been tried in South Africa where the most worrisome variant has been isolated. So J&J, &J, Novavax and AstraZeneca. And like Todd said, all three of those, even though I think a couple of them had a smaller cohort than maybe J&J, &J, um, still protected against severe disease and death. Nearly 100%, maybe not exactly, but nearly 100%. So when you hear in the news, um, scientists worried about variants, th that's, that's true because this is a virus that can mutate quite rapidly based on the composition of its genetic material. Um, it's designed, so to speak, to be able to change things up. And the more that we apply pressure on this virus, in other words, vaccinating people, the more it's going to change itself to try to be able to infect those of us who are not yet vaccinated. And so they've been talking about this race against let's get folks vaccinated before the virus has a chance to get this foothold in making these variants. And to some extent, that is largely true. So it, it is of pretty important, pretty um, prime importance to be vaccinated when you can so that we tip the scales to getting most folks vaccinated to decrease the likelihood that variant coronaviruses can get a foothold in the community. Great. Um, a couple questions out there were um, about the use of masks and this transmis transmission. Um, I, I imagine people are thinking, okay, with, with the vaccines coming out, does that mean we can stop wearing masks soon and all that? Anybody wanna? Address that. Maybe Heather can speak into that as she's kind of a frontline person <laughs> or one of the rest of you. I don't know. You're muted, Heather, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but she doesn't know how to unmute. Sorry, I Somebody had a couple else. screens open, so I couldn't get Got to it. my unmute button. Um, yeah, I, I know that the, the um, masks are so tough, you guys. I'm a mom of three, and I, I just know it's so hard on the kids. It's hard on us. I wear an N95 for so long that I get sores. Uh, you know, I've had sores on my face, and um, wearing a double mask and a face shield and a hair cover and a plastic bunny suit, I have actually gotten in my car after work and cried from the sheer discomfort of the, the personal protective equipment. Um, and I'm not even doing it as long as those ICU nurses. As an ER nurse, I can take my PPEs off and do something else. So um, 
I know the masks are really hard and um, pretty exhausting, but um, these new variants, which, um, you know, we knew that there would be variants. It's a virus's job to mutate and become more um, reproducible. That's its whole job is to replicate its DNA and spread, right? So we knew that was gonna happen. And some of these new variants are, you know, up to 70% more transmissible. So yeah, stay the course with the masks. The hope is that we can reach that herd immunity. Um, and I know there's been some herd immunity questions and I would just transition to that and just say that, um, you know, not wearing the masks, not getting vaccinated, we could just reach herd immunity naturally, right? But uh, to do that, they estimate that 1.2, 1.3 million more people in the United States would have to die before we reached herd immunity if we weren't being careful, if we weren't wearing masks and getting vaccines. So if we have a herd immunity, they're estimating right now that um, this is last week's data, so I haven't looked it up today, but last week they're thinking anywhere between 12 and 25% of the country has some herd immunity now. And that cost us about 400,000 deaths. Um, but if we can, if, if we stopped wearing the mask, if we just let the virus, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be another million. So that, those are just kind of estimates. So I know, but I hear you. The masks are so hard, you guys. Mm. Let's just stay the course though. Yeah. There's a few questions about um, the first and second doses of, of vaccines. Um, one person said, uh, given the high demand for uh, and low supplies of, for second shot requirements. There are different vaccines. I know it's not advisable, but if it came down to it, is it possible uh, specifically to get one of Moderna and one of Pfizer, something like that? Um, somebody else wrote that they had the Moderna vaccine a couple of weeks ago and it was pretty hard on them. They had a lot of uh, effects like fever, chills, body aches, and said, I'm wondering if it's gonna be that bad again with the second dose, um, et cetera. So maybe some of you, one of you could address the first dose, second dose kind of questions out there. It probably wasn't the vaccine that gave that unfortunate side effect. It was your awesome immune system <laughs> um, creating <laughs> antibodies to, to that vaccine. But do one of you guys wanna take that? Well, with regard to the question about um, is it okay to get Pfizer and then Moderna or vice versa, uh, the answer is we don't know because it hasn't been tested. Um, it, on a theoretical basis, those two vaccines are quite similar uh, in their formulation and the way that they work. There's, there's some slight differences in the lipid nanoparticles and the way that the spike mRNA um, is composed. So it, it probably... Um, if you just compare apples to apples as best you can, would probably be okay. However, scientifically, in order to say you want to have conclusive evidence that something works, you need to test it. Has it been tested? And so the answer is we don't know. And so is it true that the um, during the course of getting one dose of vaccine and the other that your immunity is gradually building up or are you immune on a certain date after getting the vaccine? Um, that was another question that came up. Can, when do you want to address that? The Moderna data were that I, I think there was roughly 50% protection two weeks into the process. And I, I mentioned after the first shot and then after the second shot at a month, it was 80 to 90%. Um, you know, it's worth getting that, that Second shot, though, uh, both to uh, raise up the uh, total protective value and hopefully to extend the duration, uh, the durability of the immunity generated by the vaccination process. I don't know if I answered that, but somebody, uh, Carolyn, you may want to weigh in with something more. I mean, uh, essentially, once you've had the booster for either Pfizer or Moderna, two weeks after that, you're fully immune as immune as you're going to be. Um, I had read actually with Moderna that in even the two weeks leading in, you can have 80% effectivity, efficacy, um, and that with Pfizer, it's 50%, but there's a lower um, duration between first and second doses with Pfizer. 
bottom line is you, you need your booster and two weeks after that, you can claim full immunity from the vaccine. I mean, as much immunity as the vaccine will give you at this point. So we may have answered this already, but I, I guess I'm maybe a little mm -hmm. dull myself uh, and somebody else asked the question. So I'm gonna say it again. Uh, why get the vaccine uh, when individuals need to continue to wear a mask and social distance? So uh, the, re the reason being is that when we get the vaccine, you're really what we know, the endpoints that we're studying is that we are preventing severe disease in ourselves. Um, that's all that we do know. That, that's what was tested. What was tested is pre pre prevention of severe COVID that ends you up in the hospital. Um, we didn't test as to whether they were having asymptomatic infections because they weren't drawing blood on, on all these participants weekly. Um, their primary endpoint was to prevent, you know, severe disease and death. So we don't know, but just because we doesn't, we don't know, doesn't mean that we potentially are um, not going to be transmitting it. We're going to find out with time. So, you know, potentially we could have a mild case of COVID. I mean, there was a, uh, there were you know, percentage of a small percentage of people that have had mild cases, but you know, they were testing for severe. Uh, potentially we could be asymptomatic, but um, you know, essentially, you know, um, it will be, will be studied going forward. Lack of evidence doesn't, doesn't equal the presence of risk. We know, however, that asymptomatic people transmit to fewer people than those who develop symptoms. So even if asymptomatic infections are possible, we have the benefit of reducing the virus overall on the other hand, we may learn that the virus decreases infection overall. That'd be great. We will see. So we'll, you know, either way, um, we should get the vaccine for our own personal risk to decrease the risk of symptomatic and severe disease. It, it will potentially reduce your risk of transmitting to others, help create more dead ends to stop transmission due to the fact that asymptomatic cases don't transmit as much. We know that. And possibly you might actually reduce transmission in a significant way. And finally, because your risk of serious side effects from the vaccine are far lower than your risk of serious side effects from the virus. But someone asked regarding to mask, to mass, I mean, at this point, we are you know, still building up our immunity. Most people are just getting their first vaccine, not the second. We are not in a safe enough spot in our community at this point to remove our masks. We need to continue to protect the vulnerable. Great. Um, Somebody asked, uh, is the current vaccine injury or death rate higher than previous vaccines? Uh, if not, how does it compare? There have been no deaths causally linked to this vaccine. And the risk of a truly severe immune reaction, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, allergic reactions, what I meant to say, like anaphylaxis, which would require aggressive treatment is, is about 11 per million. Um, the risk of anaphylaxis taking penicillin is somewhere between one and four and 10,000, as I recall. So again, that's not vaccine to vaccine, but compared with other things that we take and don't think twice about, uh, I think the risk is, is quite low. We had one person write in that said, um, she said, I've heard that since the COVID shot is an experimental biologic that we do not know how it will affect the organs in our body. Since I only have one kidney that is not functioning at 100%, I'm wondering if I should risk taking the shot. That's not been listed as a reason not to be vaccinated, uh, having a, a single kidney or a, a impaired kidney function. There are accepted reasons uh, that certain people ought not be vaccinated. That, that's not one I've seen, seen listed. And then I would say further that just as I think we've all alluded to, but Carolyn notably, the risk of infection is uh, substantial. Uh, and, and that could affect a person's whole body and or their kidneys. Uh, related to that, uh, the, the thought that this is an experimental uh, vaccine. So it's important to remember that even though Pfizer and Moderna, their technology mRNA vaccines um, have certainly not been mass utilized in people, 
they've been around for about 30 years and there have been small clinical trials of mRNA vaccines against other viruses, HIV, Zika, um, measles, and Moderna actually did one of them against influenza. And so th there's been enough practice with mRNA vaccines to the extent that the tinkering has been done such that when this pandemic came around, folks like Pfizer and Moderna were, were set to go. They had the technology to ex some extent dialed in and just swapped in the RNA for spike. And that was their formulation. So it's not like this is something that's brand new and let's give it a shot and see what happens. There's been a lot of groundwork laid to make sure, to be fairly sure, that giving this vaccine to millions upon millions of people, and the data bears this out, are not going to have large adverse effects. Um, I'm seeing a question from somebody who's had COVID um, and writes, if you've had COVID-19, been ill for several weeks, would you most likely have the am antibodies? And if this is so, what is the possibility you would be immune? And for what period of time? Um, I think part of that answer is if our question there is, if you've had this, do you still need to get the vaccine? Uh, or should you get the vaccine? What would your thoughts be on that? The answer is you have, uh, you're believed to have immunity for a period of time. And I, I've forgotten whether it's a 90 day estimate uh, th that applies to people who've received um, monoclonal antibody therapy. You're believed to have about 90 days of protection. But yes, the thought is you do need to be vaccinated for durable, longer lasting protection. I think you may have answered this earlier, but how long is the vaccine effective for? Um, any, do we know that yet? We don't. <laughs> I mean, we know that people, I think I said this earlier, but people received it last May in the trials and they still have an immune response. So mm -hmm. we're thinking about a year, but there probably will be needed, boosters needed. We don't know. Got it. Um, sorry, I'm looking, we've got a limited amount of time. I'm gonna try to end this right at eight o'clock. Um, and we've got a lot of questions coming in here. Uh, if somebody tested positive, but didn't have any symptoms, should they get the vaccine? I guess you've already answered that. They, whether or not you've had COVID, you'd still recommend getting the vaccine one way or the other, if they were symptomatic or not. There's more of a robust immune response from the vaccine. You're gonna have, the antibody levels are much higher than actually the, the way you get it from having a natural infection. And we don't even know, we don't even aren't able to really measure like T cell reaction, but in general, we've been able to see that it's just, it's a much higher response from the vaccine. I've seen two questions, uh, similar questions. Say, what about physicians who promote hydroclock or I, I don't even know what that word is. <laughs> or, come or come on, man. Uh, Hydroxychloroquine. The means. There we go. Should those treatments be taken as seriously as the EUA vaccine? Um, I'll, I'll jump in before the physicians. Uh, this gets at the heart of Again, what, what qualifies as an effective therapeutic, be it vaccines or a medicine like hydroxychloroquine? And the gold standard, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, is the randomized controlled trial. The, these are why these vaccines have been approved, even for emergency use. Um, hydroxychloroquine has been tested in, to date, several randomized controlled trials. And in every single one, there has been no difference between those treated with hydroxychloroquine and those given a placebo. And because that's the gold standard, the consensus of the vast majority, anyway, of the scientific and medical community is hydroxychloroquine has no effect. I'll, I'll let the physicians jump in there, but that's bottom line. Yes to that. With respect, did they brought that same question or bring up ivermectin? That's that's a little different story. Uh, but I yep. think we've same been getting thing. out. Of We'd be getting out of the weeds a bit to talk about it. I will only say that there was a publication in January in Chest uh, of of a uh, which is a good peer-reviewed mainstream uh, medical publication about. That's what I read. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I'm sure you do. <laughs> about lower ICU mortality and people treated with ivermectin. Uh, it wasn't the highest order study in terms of its composition, but uh, anyway, there, there may be some merit for ivermectin. Hmm. This is uh, one specifically for Heather. Can you expand on your comment that COVID-19 is different from the flu uh, in the 18 seasons that you've seen? Just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. I included that just as anecdotal evidence. Um, I, I felt the stress of the flu seasons for 18 years. I, I was pregnant or nursing, I forget, during the H1N1. Um, and I, I think I had a three month old baby during H1N1. Mm. Um, and what was the other big one uh, a few years ago? I get, I, it's all a blur. I've worked so many flu seasons. I would just say um, the severity of illness in such a higher proportion of people. I uh, am accustomed during a flu um, during a flu season to see double digits in the ER every day with symptoms. Um, not necessarily positive. We don't necessarily test people we're being discharged with. But if we're counting sore throats, runny nose, cough, fever, malaise, body aches, we'll just tally those. We call those ILIs, which are influenza-like illnesses. Uh, so I'll see ILIs in the ER um, double digits a day during a big flu season. Now that's um, without everyone wearing a mask, socially distancing, uh, staying home. Yes, there's there a lot of people are vaccinated, but um, I, I am fascinated by the numbers of COVID that I see in the ER considering how, how careful we're being and just how sick people are. Uh, during the flu season, again, this is anecdotal. I'm not usually a, worried about someone with the flu unless they are um, elderly, immunocompromised, you know, pregnant, newborn, um, but that, that very experienced ER kind of gut feeling where I can see across the parking lot often if someone's, you know, uh, septic, which Dr. Fear there just referred to, um, multi-system organ failure. You know, ER staff, we can see that stuff from, from the front door. I get that feeling from a lot of these COVID patients that I would not get from the ILI patients. Not to say I haven't seen plenty of people die from the flu. I've, yeah. I've seen more people than I can count die from the flu. But it's, it's just that kind of spidey sense you get and go, why is this 50 year old so sick? Right. Um, why do I just, why am I calling a doctor in right now for something I should be able to handle, you know, really easily. So it's just, it's just got another, it just has a, a different sense. So you're not gonna read about that in the data. It's more just that boots on the ground. Yeah lots of experience this just has a um a different tenor to it my mom had covid she's 71 healthy has at she probably doesn't appreciate me telling her age but um i saw her and it, she was so sick you guys and uh, i just had a different sense of urgency about it than if she had had the flu well, man, there are so many questions probably that, that could have been addressed that didn't, but you guys covered a tremendous amount in a short period of time. And I wanted to honor everybody's time by keeping this to a, a one hour time frame. We have recorded this and uh, we'll post it somewhere online or on our YouTube page where people, I think we hit a max number of people who could tune in and then others who wanted to be in tonight uh, weren't able to access it, but they'll be able to watch the recording. Um, if you have any other questions that we weren't able to get to, um, we'll, we'll try to find a way to allow some of our uh, experts here to continue to address those. Um, but I just wanna say thank you to each one of you panelists for weighing in and uh, it's been a really, Excellent presentation. Todd, did you have one more word you want to say? Yeah, I'm sorry because I touched on this briefly and it's not a vaccine directly related thing, but it's a potential lifesaver, certainly a, a suffering saver. If you are diagnosed with the COVID-19 illness and have a diagnosis and you're 65 years of, of age or above, then the first 10 days you're a candidate on a clone antibody therapy. 
and uh, it's an absolute game changer. Uh, and you could call my office for information on that or, or Goleta Valley Emergency Room. Mm -hmm. You can just call the Goleta Valley ER directly if you want information on how to get that. I attribute prayer and that to my mom's remarkable turnaround. I'm one of the infusion nurses. I worked the infusion suite out there the other day and I'm working again on Thursday. So I, I've given the, the antibodies and people typically tolerate it very well. Yeah. Well, Carolyn, Heather, Steve, Todd, thank you guys so much for sharing your, your knowledge and experience with us. And uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight. And let's uh, pray that God rids us of this uh, real scourge soon. I know we all want to get back to normal soon. And uh, that's my prayer. So thanks all. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.